And we're back. I am incredibly excited to be here for hopefully our first of many Friday afternoon swan calls with my good buddies Pat Barilla and Daniel Ma. And we're going to try and see if we can plot out a, a financially viable path for world conquest. <laughs> and, uh, I'll start with praying. Dear God, I just thank you for these men and for the chance to just talk with them, for having the freedom to sit down. And I don't know what the future holds, uh, even an hour from now, but I'm glad that you hold the future. You've brought us so far. We've done so many cool things together, and I know that there will be some way for this to continue. And I just pray for peace and joy and friendship along the way. Amen. All right. So there's a couple of balls in the air. Uh, well, there's many balls in the air in, in terms of the things I'm looking at for work, but the two most interesting ideas that have bounced around. One is this content workflow system that I talked about, which was thinking about, you know, can we build the ultimate CMS and using the SWAN technology as a shim on top of all the other stuff you have to deal with, including uh, probably the, the craziest part of that is as a shim on top of DNS. Uh, I heard a talk, actually I heard a summary of a talk about DNS, and someone once said that the hard thing about DNS is that all it does is naming and caching. You know, the two hard problems that computers are horrible at, uh, or at least programming is horrible at. So it is an interesting, uh, uh, but possibly a completely insane thought experiment is, you know, a big part of the pain of setting up a website is managing DNS, right? Buying the domain from here, setting up the redirects, and, you know, is this a domain name? Is this going to be a subdomain? Is it going to be an alias? And it's actually an interesting um, thought is if you build a language specifically to handle naming and caching, could that make DNS a tractable problem? Um, it's probably too big of a rat hole to go into now, but... Uh, that was the crazy part of that. The second thing that came up was this discussion with transforming the bay with Christ. Uh, and they, they're the person I've exchanged the most emails with. Um, and they do have a bunch of high-powered individuals uh, backing them. And the interesting thing, that what they probably want is something more like a social network. And so one of the questions I wanted to discuss with you, I don't know if you have any background in this, is from what I understand... Uh, social networks were kind of the people who invented the modern NoSQL movement because relational databases are a really poor fit for that kind of data. Any of you know anything about that? Nope. I mean, I, I've, I've actually done a fair amount of research into NoSQL in the last three weeks because I've been considering, I've been trying to figure out why, why people use NoSQL databases. Why they um, do don't. Why they do? Okay. Because um, I, I I haven't and and honestly I can't really. There's like a few like sparse um, sparse like uh, examples on like the Mongo website about why um, NoSQL is great, and they mainly wrap around the problem we discussed with CMS, which is you know changing schemas. Um, and then I've the, the I haven't really found any like smart analytical like thoughtful pieces on why we should use no sequel. Oh, still there? Analytical pieces I found was am I a loser? Are all about why my why no sequel is, is dumb. Uh, <laughs> so I really don't I don't really I'm I'm lost on the no sequel thing actually is I guess all I have to say. This is probably a good uh sorry, but Pat, any thoughts or uh, history? No, um, no, nothing at all. I, I'm not really familiar with those technologies. I don't don't use them <laughs> too much in in my day to day. Wow, Infinite Mirror, that's pretty cool. Let's let's, um, let's talk through the um, the data points here. Can you guys see, see my? I guess you can't see my screen, Daniel. I assume you I, can. I, I can now, actually. Oh, okay. You're in a physical location. Mm -hmm. That was pretty seamless. Um, Okay, so why NoSQL? Um, so, 
uh, the advantage is. So the uh, over. Well, it might be. It might be. It might be worthwhile if we just like define it because what, what like what is NoSQL? Okay. I know that it's like a SQL replacement, right? But like, why is it better than SQL? Right. I think it's the the short answer is what is. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Um, Mechanism for certain other than tabular relations. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, yeah. So the advantage is okay. So I think the um, pop is uh, that the um, you know relational is rigid, right? The big advantage of relational is it's rigid. Is that you've got? Fixed, I mean, and, and I think the part was talking about the almost a caricature of an SQL database because actual SQL databases, especially Postgres and so forth, have added a lot of these features over time. Um, it's, got, it's got joins. I think I think we lost um, Daniel. Oh, there we go. He's back. <laughs> yes, you back, you back uh, on audio or video, Daniel? Yep, I'm back. Okay, so I think the big thing about um, so you know, is that relational databases is rigid. You have fixed schemas, you have joins between tables, uh, which create dependencies, and the um, and so the um, um, the general sense is that I think um, a the you guys are familiar with the cap theorem, right? It's gotta be on this page somewhere. Now what is the what is the cap theorem? Okay. <laughs> Luckily I'm connected to a global network, so I can Right. With, yeah. I can retrieve the information through the air. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This really it's possible. Consistency, availability, partition tolerance. Okay. And traditional databases um, This is only a recent recent theory. Um, a theorem, I should say. At least you have to nineteen ninety five. Okay. Nineteen ninety eight. Hmm. Okay, so yeah, well, That's I, it was Man, only two thousand and two uh, that it's been proved. Although people have, uh, so it has actually there's actually some controversy about how much whether it's actually been proved. Um, but the basic idea is that you don't have infinite, perfectly reliable transmission faster than the speed of light, right? Mm -hmm. You have more than one node, then, and you have a finite latency. Either you have to wait until all the nodes are updated, or you have to get by with less than perfect updating. Um, and you know, when you're only on a single node, none of this matters. But if you want to get bigger than that, then you have to worry about what do you give up. It's kind of like good, fast, and cheap. Choose two. Uh huh. And so, <laughs> um, the uh, and the more you provide a one, the less you provide the other. So, 
the idea is um, that you know NoSQL allows different trade-offs than traditional RDMS data management systems, though some were um, actually had no SQL features. Um, okay, the the things that we are most interested in um, that from this perspective, one is that um, uh, things that is what I'm most interested in speaking for us um, is um, easy setup. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've done PostgreSQL, you know, and the overhead of actually having to like create the table like cost me like a day in the last project I went, was in. <laughs> We're all seventy-year-old technologies, and the anything that's uh, it's, it's just you know even just initializing the database and the log and authentication, everything like well like Meteor or something that's using MongoDB. It's like you give a URL, boom, you go. I mean. It's, it's, it's uh, not necessarily, um, and then, um, and, and, and also then is that most, of, like, as far as I can tell, all the databases I've used expect you to be a local connection. It's like the way the thing is set up is you're expected to be running on the machine with the database. And you set up an SSH tunnel to talk to it. Mm. Like, what decade were these things invented in? Oh, they were invented before <laughs> the internet. Of course, that's how they were designed. Like, they were invented before client server. Most of these, yeah. right? server was a layer on top of that. And so, um, it's just kind of funny. The thing that's like, uh, we want to. Um, uh, you know, So the ability to store other stuff other than, you know, the um, typical already relational databases, like blobs are considered evil by relational databases. Mm -hmm. They mess up all the way, all the finely tuned optimizations that they worry about. Um, and the, the really interesting thing for me is we might want to manage dependencies at the language level. Right? The, the downsides um, and I guess the flip side of the relational being rigid is that NoSQL can be fragile. Daniel, do you remember some of the critiques of NoSQL that you were reading about? Uh, it, it mostly actually has to do with uh, it's, it's along the lines of um, that schemas were designed to help make sure that our data stayed consistent. Right. That that data becomes inconsistent way too fast, uh, and um, like some of the, the trade offs that, that you were discussing, it's uh, they were they were just they seemed frustrated. Um, it, but it was it, it mostly around just that was the biggest thing I picked up was that schemas schemas keep our data consistent and when data becomes inconsistent you have a bigger problem than how you than the issue of trying to figure out what schema you needed in the first place. Right. The yeah. the argument is that the hard work up front to make the right schema and the annoying the annoying reality of dealing with database migrations and stuff is worth is less painful than realizing that you have no idea what data you have. Yes, or whether it's correct. Yes, and this is a okay. Good. That's the um, right, and that's why I think the 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 best practices that I've heard is that your authoritative data record should live in something like an RDMS, where it's really locked down, but that um, you essentially cache it in a NoSQL database. Because there's all sorts of overhead around SQL and around oh yeah that's another thing is that you know 
SQL is possibly the worst language I've ever used. <laughs> it makes JavaScript seem sane and rational. Fair enough. <laughs> um, and having to think in SQL and like you have to go through all these gymnastics to get to what you want. So, so we'll do this Swan Factory thing. Uh, we'll we'll just we'll just stipulate for the moment that I'm not completely insane, just for the purposes of this discussion. And <laughs> um, you know, what would be better? What's, so what you want is a system that is very lightweight. Can handle structured and unstructured data, data, and as a robust mechanism for specifying um, uh, uh, specifying invariants, in particular, um, immutability is a first-class property. Um, so the hypothesis is that um, if you could get, um, well, let me just uh, free will on this for a little bit. The idea is uh, most data is red, right? That's uh, is is, is read only. Um, and that um, consistency is only a problem when written and writing. So therefore, um, the way that a relational databases maintain consistency is with um, atomic updates across multiple tables, right? Um, this ensure consistency with write blocks across multiple tables. Um, you know, people assumes readers and live with stale data. Well, like with a racial database, you either get the right current answer or you get nothing at all. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh -huh. um, so the idea is that, okay, um, assumptions. Uh, uh, well, let's work for this. Let's call it uh, premises. Okay. Um, so proposal. So what if um, all data is immutable? Is assumed immutable by default. However, names and proxy to the latest version. So we'd say that you know it's kind of like Git in that sense, in that you store every version, but when you check it out, you get the latest version. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And then um, all data knows. Um, ah, we have dynamic properties, which are actually computed names. Um, and names where uh, um, uh, data on the fly and cache. So we did this for the hour of Node. Um, you familiar with Swift? Uh, I think, think uh, what they call it in Swift Pad is it is it dynamic properties or? So basically, you can have uh, something that looks like a property, but it's really a a method. Well, they have dynamic properties in core data. Oh, right, yeah. 
Uh, did we, we have the, those in JavaScript now too. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, we have getters and setters. They're actually way more. Sta- I, I, they're 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 way more standard than uh, you'd think they are. Or because they're ES5, not ES6. Right. Yeah. Right. So the idea would be that um, that we yeah. Therefore, we always write names but read data. Um, we write to uh, all values. Let's, let's do the name name value distinction that's at the heart of of frame and now swan. Write to name write. Read immutable data, either immutable values, all non trivial uh, values know uh, their. Actually, no, let's just say all names know their dependency chain. Um, so the idea would be. But I want a data store, so we um, want a uh, um, essentially it's like a, a worm drive. You guys remember those for that, that terminology? No, no, it's worm drives. Read multiple, aka append only. Is that? The primary data store is that I want to be able to generate these values immutably. And maybe there's some Git style data expression with we if we ever get to that scale where we worry about it. But it is that you're always writing values uh, uh, against a key, but each key could have multiple values and ah, that's thing and, uh, and um, all generated values track their version dependencies. Uh, right, so we have, you know, foo, you know, dot foo equals uh, bar, right, is our assignment of bar to foo. And then if I do dot foo and, uh, and then if I do dot foo Gar, then it'd be something like, you know, foo is this list where you know the original version is bar and the latest version is gar. And if I ask for foo, I get gar back. Okay. And that if I have um, that foo bar um, equals the hello foo, right? Let's say so. Then I do foo bar. Hello. So now if I do foobar here, I get right, because it's a closure, it's void arguments, it, right? And so the idea is and um, and that, in a sense, foobar also has the same sort of version list. Mm. It seems like if I did that, then I could store, um, then I could be guaranteed that foobar would always represent a consistent view of the world. Right? That the magic that it knows, that it would do a either a read time or write time, it's invisible to the user, because I don't want to play with the latency, 
that that value is always consistent. So if it has, you know, uh, you know, the, the 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 trick is doing this across multiple. Um, non-trivial dependencies. Um, it's really what I want, uh, you know, really, you know, what we ideally want is just a fast in-memory cache of uh, valid web pages, right? Mm -hmm. That you know, and they can be generated, and uh, you know, which are generated on the fly um, in advance. If we know we'll need them, but lazily if they are rare. But, you know, it is. Kind of strange when you think about it. You know, if your home page is not user dependent, so rather than the idea that we're storing the data in the database and whenever we hit the web server, we check the database for the latest information. At least that's how Rails always does it, right? Mm -hmm. Manual by default. Yeah. If instead you say, okay, your goal, I write a, a, a an app that generates a web page, and any time the data that makes it up changes, at that point I regenerate it. Okay. Okay. Right, and so, which means, um, so, in the default case, we generate web pages whenever the data changes, which we assume that is rare compared to reads. And this is essentially a reactive database. Yeah, just thinking, just thinking about. It. Good. Does anyone build something like this? I don't know, but it would be pretty cool if it worked. Is there a good reason <laughs> mm. nobody does this? The app, um, the app that I'm working on now, kind of fakes it with reactive Kirko and and Realm, where right. all the labels and stuff like, are observers. React. Yeah. So right, everyone's. Everyone's doing react. I mean, and this is this is essentially functional reactive. This is this is this is basically this is basically RFP uh, SRP, right? Mm-hmm. Programming doing reactive UIs. Is anyone doing reactive models? Okay, I guess we have this worldwide thing. Let's see what we'll say about that. Well, here we go. Someone's got a reactive database. So what there is seems to be new, relatively recent stuff. Uh, right, so they're doing it to the database transaction logic. Mm. Um, That's interesting. This, this is a completely useless abstract. <laughs> Let's 
an abstract framework. Okay, now that they actually build a database. <laughs> that would be cool <laughs> to ask. <laughs> um, so the, anything in there? Citation list. This is interesting because that's one of the things that I, uh, constraint databases. That's possibly the, Everyone's building algebras. <laughs> Why does everyone build algebras instead of products? <laughs> yeah. It's easier to write papers. Is that <laughs> tenure, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is what's. Uh... People ask me, I've got this crazy research project. Why don't you actually just go into academia? And it's like academia is the problem that I'm trying to solve. Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, it's an interesting. So at least at the sniff test level, it seems like there is something here. Um, so what do we need? We worm drive. We need, you know, Swan semantics. Um, you know, dynamic properties. JavaScript. Um, the but yeah, in some sense, that's um, you know, and then, you know. Uh, I mean, the first word of that really seems to be it, right? You need to basically be able to store everything you get in a safe way, and you need to have a really good name resolution mechanism. And it seems like that would actually be, you know, and then some sort of restful. Uh, restful. API. I'm sure I'm missing something massive and obvious and horrific, but <laughs> you know, at least at the Friday afternoon beer bash level, it seems like it's Conceivable. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's put on the black hat and pick apart why this is a bad idea. Okay. Yeah. Um. No one. No formal schemas. Screw up migration. Okay. Uh, answer, um, we never care about the data. We only care about the exposed names. Um, let me see. We can continue to read data. From the old using older names. So okay, rock solid, totally awesome version management at level. Okay, <laughs> how long will the persistent like how long will the history of each of the um uh, each of the things be? That should be tuner, right? Because the idea is that if you care, 
you know, if maybe if it's if it's if it's um, um, let me see. Okay, let's um, let's actually make that an object then. Get around forever. Expensive. Slow. That's where we only keep fresh. We keep uh this is it. Right. I mean, it seems like we're finally at the point in our evolution as a species where we should not be throwing stuff away. Yeah. We just like, okay, let's just send this extra gigabyte of stuff we don't need up to Amazon Glacier. Yeah, exactly. That's what Glacier's there for. <laughs> right. I mean, certainly, the amount of data anyone's going to trust people as crazy as us with in the near future is ridiculously small. <laughs> so build the system <laughs> assuming that it's that we can store everything forever. Um, um, be won't be that hard. It's it's style diffing. See. Have the primitives. Right, if we can regenerate everything, and we don't have to store all, like, all the web pages, we just store the template and the inputs. And when one input changes, we only have to change that. Right? Hello? Anyone still there? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Right. So, uh... That's fair. I was going to say the other thing, the, the first thing that jumps out to me that's like an issue is um, that, uh, and I guess this is a problem that can be solved, but it's still a, a real problem, like especially in the hour of Node. Automatic subscription is is a big problem when you get into... Uh, Remember, we we, we we had we had things happen with the R of Node where, like, all of a sudden, it took two seconds for a turtle to move, and it was because it was checking its dependency chain about like it was like ten thousand times it had to check go through its dependency chain. Um, and I feel I feel like the only way this would work and be convenient is like automatic subscription, I guess. But there has to be something really smart about how we do it and possibly even new in paradigm for how we could... Um, for how we could uh, not have terrible performance, I guess. Right, so let's think about this in the context of a... Um, right, so the, the worst-case scenario is like a massively multiplayer game, right, where everybody in your line of sight, you know, you see everyone in your line of sight, and if you do, that means every time you move your character, you have to update all 500 people who can see you in the crowd, right? Mm -hmm. is, that, is that a good worst case scenario? I mean, well, I, oh, I guess. Don't forget, the reason that the hour of node had the blow up, the bug that you found, is that check, checking for non-dependency was what made things ridiculously expensive, right? Yeah. Um, I would argue that it was still pretty expensive because it was still pretty slow. It didn't crash, but it was. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't exactly super quick to respond. Right. The. The question is. Where did that cost come from? 
don't know. I don't know that I have a good answer for that one. Right, because the... Um, it's really bad for changing an example. Uh, let's, so let's, let's just work with this example. Um, the example well, is... Speaking, speaking about um, MMOs, it brings up a good point. So basically movement in MMOs has two different ways of being handled. Um, the traditional way, which is what every MMO on Earth does, is you hit forward to move. It asks the server if you can move. The server says you can, and so you move. And so movement becomes kind of laggy and feels really heavy. Um, but World of Warcraft does it a little different, where all the movement is determined by the client, and after the movement occurs, it tells the server. And so you get less jumping, or you get less jumping around. You get a more responsive um, experience. And so it seems like what you're explaining then with the turtles is you were, made, the server was determining whether or not the turtle could move. Where a different way to do it would be, the client determines it and it just validates to make sure it's okay with the server. Right. So then, um, then what happens then if the server is not okay with it? Uh, then um, basically. Would there ever be a reason, based on the model that we're describing now, and that the fact that the client knows everything about the turtle's constraints, would there ever be a reason why the turtle couldn't move? Well, I guess the question of World of Warcraft, if you move into a square that someone else already moved into, which I presume is why other people check, how does World of Warcraft... Oh, no, 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 there's no, there's no, uh, there's no collision. <laughs> so you can, you can be right next to someone or right on top of someone. And you just move through. Yeah, yeah, you just run through them. That's the way you solve that problem, right? Is you have static. Constraints. Yeah, there are some things like obstacles which you can't can't go through, but that obstacle data is stored on the client as well. Right. So all the geometry for the world is stored on the client, and so it knows if it can move through it or not. Yeah. So, and then this is you know push constraints. Um, uh, validation into the client review layer. So that's a good point. The and so like say say World of Warcraft decided tomorrow that you can't move through people. That's still easy to solve because the client has all the information about where the people are at that point when the movement is about to occur. Right, but it does mean that you could get the the lock switch where two people are both told that they can move to the same location. That's right, and that, that's easily resolvable. There's um, a couple of games that resolve that by either popping both of them um, apart or um, working out who was there first and then shifting the position of the other person. Mm -hmm. And you can, do like, you can do, like, predictive moving as well. So, like, if someone's velocity is pretty high and they're running towards you, then chances are that at the next update they're going to be whatever their speed per second is um, times the amount of time it takes to update. So you can kind of guess as well. Right. And, I realize, and the, the other answer, which I think is probably the, the right one, is you just have to be lazy. Yeah. <laughs> like, like if this value actually depends on these other values and you don't want to pay the hit at the time you write it, then you say, okay, we'll just mark it dirty, that these mm -hmm. values are all dirty, and that's a, a much cheaper, that should be a much cheaper. So we need um, 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 you know, really cheap uh, mark dirty. What is, is there a word for that thing? Marking dirty pages or vaulting? Mm, I'm not sure. No idea. I think Mark Daddy works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, other thoughts offhand? I think the only other thing I can think of is just this is a super it's an extremely rigid strat it's an extremely rigid stack. Like at the point that you have the database hooked in at that level to create content, um, you can't really use anything else. Right. This 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 
uh, takes over most of the stack. Right. And that's that can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what you wanted out of it. But that's the only other thing I could say that could be an issue. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is a this this is the the whole point is that you know yeah right the you know the premise is that the existing layering is fundamentally wrong. Well, and must be destroyed. And on that cheery note, <laughs> <laughs> actually, let me uh, stop the broadcast and I'll fill you in on the job search because it gets into some of this. <laughs> Goodbye. Thanks for watching.